Hi, boys and girls. Today we're going to start off with com um, continuing our read aloud Charlotte's Web. Um, yesterday in Charlotte's Web, we read about all the trouble that Wilbur got into for wandering out of his pen and all of the ruckus that it caused with Mr. Zuckerman and Mrs. Zuckerman and Lurvy, the, ha um, uh, the handyman and um, so today we're going to see, you know, he was, Wilbur was very upset because he missed Fern and we saw that he didn't really understand why everyone was trying to get, or trying to run over to him. And he was happy to finally just be back in his pig pen because all of the chaos was a lot for him. So today we are going to be reading chapter four, Loneliness. The next day was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped steadily from the, from the eaves. Rain fell into the barnyard and ran into crooked courses down into the lane where thistles and pigweed grew. Rain splattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen window and came gushing out of the downspouts. Rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they grazed in the meadow. When the sheep tired of standing in the rain, they, slowly, they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. Rain upset Wilbur's plans. Wilbur had planned to go out this day and dig a new hole in his yard. He had other plans, too. His plans for the day went something like this. Breakfast at 6.30, skim milk, crust, middlings, bits of donuts, wheat cakes with drops of maple syrup sticking to them, potato skins, leftover custard pudding with raisins and bits of shredded wheat. Breakfast would be finished at 7. From 8 to 7, Wilbur, Wilbur planned to have a talk with Templeton, the rat that lived under his trout. Talking with Templeton was not the most interesting occupation in the world, but it was better than nothing. All right, so we have a new character they're introducing. This is our new character, Templeton, and he's the rat. From 8 to 9, Wilbur planned to take a nap outdoors in the sun. From 9 to 11, he planned to dig a hole or trench and possibly find something good to eat buried in the dirt. From 11 to 12, he had planned to stand still and watch, over, and watch flies on the boards, watching bees in the clover and watching swallows in the air 12 o'clock lunchtime middlings warm water apple pears pairings meat gravy carrot scrapings meat scrapes stale homely and a wrapper off a package of cheese lunch would be over at one from one to two wilbur planned to sleep from two to three he planned to scratch itchy places by rubbing against the fence from three to four he planned to stand perfectly still and think of what it was like to be alive and to wait for Fern. At four would come supper, skim milk, provender, leftover sandwich from Lurvy's lunchbox, prune skins, a morsel of this, a bit of that, fried potatoes, marmalade drippings, a little more of this, a little more of that, a piece of baked apple, a scrape of upside down cake. Wilbur had gone to sleep thinking about these plans. He woke at six and saw the rain, and it seemed as though he couldn't bear it. I got everything all beautifully planned out, and it has to go and rain, he said. For a while, he stood gloomily indoors. Then he walked to the door and looked out. Drops of rain stuck his, stuck, struck his face. His yard was cold and wet. His trout had an inch of rainwater in it. Templeton was nowhere to be seen. Are you out there, Templeton? called Wilbur. There was no answer. Suddenly, Wilbur felt lonely and friendless. So, like, I'm wondering now, where is Fern? I'm surprised she hasn't come since the last time she saw him and she was watching him on her stool. Obviously, Wilbur is very um, lonely and he misses being around Fern and living at her house. One day, just like another, he groaned, I'm very young. I have no real friend here in the barn. It's going to rain all morning and all afternoon, and Fern won't come in such bad weather. Oh, honestly. And Wilbur was crying again for the second time in two days. At 6.30, Wilbur heard the banging of a pail. Lurvy was standing outside in the rain, stirring up breakfast. Come on, pig, said Lurvy. Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy dumped the slop, scraped the pail, and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted love. He wanted a friend, someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose, who was sitting quietly in a corner of the sheepfold. Will you come over and play with me? He asked. Sorry, Sonny, sorry, said the goose. 
I'm sitting, sitting on my eggs. Eight of them. Gotta keep them toasty, oasty, oasty warm. I have to stay right here. I'm no flibbery, ibbery, gibber, gibber. I did not play, I do not play with their, I do not play when there are eggs to hatch. I'm expecting goslings. Well, I didn't think you were expecting woodpeckers, said Wilbur bitterly. Wilbur next tried one of the lambs. Will you please play with me? He asked. Certainly not said the lamb. In the first place, I cannot get into your pen, as I am not old enough to jump over the fence. In the second place, I am not interested in pigs. Pigs mean less than nothing to me. Wow, that lamb seems not the kindest person. What do you mean, less than nothing? replied Wilbur. I don't think there is any such thing as less than nothing. Nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingness. It's lowest you can go. It's the end of the line. How can something be less than nothing? If there were something that was less than nothing, then nothing would not be nothing. It would be something, even though it's just a very little bit of something. But if nothing is nothing, then nothing has nothing that is less than it is. Oh, be quiet, said the lamb. Go play by yourself. I don't play with pigs. Sadly, Wilbur laid down and listened to the rain. Soon, he saw the rat climbing down a slanted board that he used as a stairway. Will you play with me, Templeton? asked Wilbur. So here we have our picture. And remember, we've discussed in class about how pictures, they're put in there for a reason. The author has a purpose for putting those pictures in. And in this case, this picture is put in to show you what had just happened on the previous page, that Wilbur was trying to get the lamb to play with him. But the lamb is talking to him and saying, no, he doesn't play with pigs. Play, said Templeton, twirling his whiskers. Play, I hardly know the meaning of that wor of the word. Well, said Wilbur, it means to have fun, to frolic, to run, to skip, and to make mer and to make merry. I never do those things if I can avoid them, replied the rat sourly. I prefer to spend my time eating, gnawing, gnawing, spying, and hiding. I'm a glut. I'm a glutton. But merry, not a merrymaker. Right, oh, sorry, boys and girls. Right now, I am on my way to your trout to eat your breakfast since you haven't gotten any sense to eat it yourself. And Templeton the rat crept stealthily along the wall and disappeared into a private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trout in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat, and he had things pretty much his own way. The tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig trout without coming out into the open. He had tunnels and runways all over Mr. Zuckerman's farm and could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually he slept during the day and was abroad only after dark. Wilbur watched him disappear into the tunnel. In a moment he saw the rat's sharp nose poke out from underneath the wooden trout. Cautiously, Templeton pulled himself over the edge of the trowel. This was almost more than Wilbur could stand. On this dreary, rainy day to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else, he knew Templeton was getting soaked out there in the pouring rain, but even that didn't comfort him. Friendless, dejected, and hungry, he threw himself down in the manure and sobbed. Late that afternoon, Lurvy went, into went to Mr. Zuckerman, I think there's something wrong, wrong with that pig of yours. He hasn't had, he hasn't touched his food. Give him two spoons full of sulfur and a little molasses, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what was happening to him when Lurvy caught him and forced the medicine down his throat. This was certainly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness anymore. So here we see Wilbur. He looks all sad after he was forced to have medicine because he just wants to be loved and he feels very lonely. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and the noises of the sheep chewing their cuds and occasionally the rattle of a cow chain up overhead. You can imagine Wilbur's surprise when out of the darkness came a small voice he had never heard before. It sounded rather thin, but pleasant. Do you want a friend, Wilbur? It said. I'll be your friend to you. Oh, wa I watched you all day and I like you. But I can't see you, said Wilbur, jumping to his feet. Where are you and who are you? 
I'm right up here, said the voice. Go to sleep. You'll see me in the morning. All right, so that is the end of our chapter, uh, this chapter four. Tomorrow we'll be reading chapter five. I hope you're enjoying Charlotte's Web so far.